Today, we have Dan Gebler joining us. Dan is the Director of Product Management at Meta and has led product teams at SoundCloud and Adobe, just to name a few. We're going to discuss the following topics with Dan. Product vision, the importance of that and how to get to it and sell it. User testing, both qual and quant. Global and AI ramifications within product. And getting into product management itself, what does that role look like? Lastly, he's going to share some advice, including the importance of curiosity. So you'll want to stick around for that last part. Well, let's learn together. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, as a product leader in multiple companies, um, first off, how did you even get to that point? Like, what kind of led to you becoming a product leader, a product manager, plus a product leader? And, uh, you know, how, why product management, I guess? So first, how did you get there? And then maybe like, why? Yeah, um, really good question. I think for people today, there are uh, there are programs you can do. There are yeah. uh, courses you can take. Um, but yeah, when I got going, there was no, there was none of that. Uh, yeah. And product management was really poorly defined. I think some of the big companies had uh, had definitions, and but what they would call a product manager at Microsoft twenty years ago was really different than what we might know today. Uh, so yeah, I think the the I mean, the way I came to it, and, and people come from, you know, any discipline, engineering, data, um, I came through the design and the content side. Uh, I was, that's what I knew how to do coming out of school, uh, yeah. was to, uh, to write and solve problems through writing. And so, um, so that's where I started. Uh, and then worked my way through UX design and trying to figure out how, uh, how experiences were built. Um, yeah. And I think product seem to be the natural evolution of that where you had a chance to actually uh, yeah really be at the definition spot of how you solve a problem uh, what it is that you're actually uh, trying to move as an organization um, whether it's a metric or a product release or whatever it might be and so uh, yeah that's how I that's how I got into it and started with the editing and the writing moved to boxes and arrows and UX design and <laughs> then the strategy came and suddenly uh, the thing that was needed was to be a product leader. Uh, yeah. I would say I have a similar path as you know, <laughs> uh, you know, fell into a design to strategy to then becoming a product manager, even though as a strategist, you know, starting, but it, you also said problem solving is kind of like the key. That's interesting to me. Um, I've seen that. Uh, with you, but like, also, I, I'm curious about that. Like, what about that? Is it, this solves problems for users, it solves problems for the company. It is the heart of what you sell. What problem do you gravitate towards? Yeah. I mean, it really could be any of those. Um, sure. I think a lot of times, um, uh, you know, a product manager's success is really built on whether or not you know, they understand uh, what kind of problem they're solving. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I think we all want to believe that, uh, and, and, you know, I largely do, that if you build the right product and solve uh, a customer problem, uh, mm -hmm. make a product that's great and that uh, customers want to use to address something that they need to do in either their daily life or their work, uh, then you'll find a lot of success. Um, but we all know working for companies and you and I have worked for some big companies and small companies that, uh, uh, that sometimes the business is also asked to solve problems in order to keep a product afloat or to grow a market or to, uh, to find business success. And so I think that in reality, uh, you know, being successful as a product manager is finding the right balance where you can ensure that you're solving customer challenges and customer problems, but uh, but doing it in a way that drives your business forward. I think it's a, it is a tricky, a tricky thing, but it's, uh, you know, the, the two have to work, uh, otherwise, uh, something is missing in your, you know, in your success scenario. Yeah. And well, one thing I found interesting in Adobe, which was who is the user, who is the customer, the end customer, that's a known thing, whoever gives you revenue, but for products, I saw for the first time at Adobe where your product could be internal. It could be both internal or external. Does the same philosophy, like you just mentioned, hold true for internal audiences? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I think the, um, 
you know, even in a current role where I'm designing, uh, you know, our groups are designing product to help uh, solve customer support scenarios in, the, you know, in a bunch of different contexts, the, uh, the users really, there's the end user who brings a problem and is seeking support yeah. from the company. Um, but there's also an agent who is trying to help that customer and use the tools to, you know, to make sure that they can provide uh, the fastest, most effective and most efficient support. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, in a kind of a B to B to C world, you're really, right. you know, you're really designing for both at the same time and you're measuring success against the overall outcome, even though um, you're really um, sometimes designing for, you know, a, a, an employee or a co-employee, or sometimes you're designing for the user themselves. Right. Yeah, that's weird, isn't it? Like, it, <laughs> like the shift. Uh, well, maybe it's not a shift, but more, more a realization of like, the customer is always right, but the customer then also has intermittent type processes in between that could be B2B, B2B, B2C, you know, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, one of the challenges that, uh, you know, I remember when I, I took my first B2B role and, you know, there was mobile was mobile design and mobile experiences were, you know, were growing tremendously. And, and uh, I remember designing um, and running a project for a mobile experience for a, a B2B scenario. And everyone said, well, it doesn't have to look great because it's a, you know, it's the, uh, it, it's an internal customer or it's a business customer. And it's not right. like it's an app that users are going to download on the, you know, in the app store <laughs> and Google play. So why, sure. you know, why does it need to look great? And I think that's really the wrong idea. What we found mm -hmm. is that everybody is a user of these experiences is ev everyone needs an outcome from it. So you really shouldn't change your, your view about how to create a, you know, a, I mean, delightful is like a really overused word in how you describe these experiences, but the experience has to have a great outcome, whether you are an end user customer um, or you're an internal business customer. Uh, it just, there really isn't any excuse for designing something and building something that won't work really well. Yeah. Well, even you, you just mentioned design, which is kind of like tossed out the window often for internal stuff. I frankly remember designing, uh, internet for a couple of companies that they were like, ah, screw this as right. far as design and UX. And you're saying that's the absolute wrong move. And I agree, but I'm, I, that's interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there are delight features which help create stickiness that you sure. may not need the same way um, with internal, uh, you know, B2B customers or with uh, with internal tools. Right. Uh, but when you're tools talking about might be different. The, those can be different. Yeah. Yeah. But I think when you're talking about, you know, I mean, like a customer support agent who is managing a bunch of different, uh, you know, a bunch of different tasks at the same time, maybe different conversations via chat or phone or email. Uh, they need an experience that makes uh, that makes their job um, intuitive and clear uh, and, you know, is easy for them to relay progress. I mean, they're basically doing task completion in a very similar way to somebody who is trying to successfully book a flight or an Airbnb or, you know, um, fill out a, fill out a form or, uh, whatever the, the end user scenario might be. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And we've seen a little bit of that at Adobe, but you mentioned your current role. Um, would you mind talking about that? Uh, you're at Meta um, and director product. Like, what are you doing there? Yeah. So at Meta, uh, what we're trying to do is to build, um, I mean, Meta for ages has been a bunch of different products that have had uh, very different kinds of support experiences within them. So, you know, support in some capacity for Facebook, some capacity for Instagram, for WhatsApp. And so our group is really trying to um, build the kind of the common platform and experiences to help uh, meta customers, uh, no matter no matter which products they use. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the, the role is really around um, building a team to work very closely with our operations groups and, and pick uh, particular customer problems to to solve. Um, yeah, that's, that's the core of it. Yeah, that, I mean, that's interesting. Um, because that when I think of Facebook, Instagram, I don't think of customer support necessarily. And maybe that's the problem <laughs> is that, you know, that needs to be filled. Um, 
One question I have then is uh, something I've seen from you in the past, which is how do you get to a product from vision and how do you get to that vision from users or internal? Like, so maybe start with the first thing. Um, you have a vision of something. What do you do? Because that is not a product. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this kind of goes back to the, you know, what are you trying to accomplish as a yeah. as an organization or as a, so yeah, mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, one of the nice things that draws people into product careers is the kind of complementary way that, that that strategy and vision, sorry, that strategy and execution work together. Sure. So being able to have a, a vision and really play that out, uh, you know, with uh uh, really understanding where you want to go. Um, that's the fun part. Um, yeah. uh, and then once you have a really good plan, the execution comes into play, but you know, how do you get to that vision? It's tough. I mean, in a company yeah. like, uh, like Meta or Adobe or, you know, companies that have had a ton of success with really great products. Um, I think that the, the only way to succeed is to break a problem down into something that's achievable in, in, finite in a way um like obviously you want to say hey i want to have the you know the best support on the planet you know for all three and a half billion <laughs> customers that meta has you know it's uh it's a hard thing to scale and to promise in a three-year plan uh and so you have to break things down into a particular uh you know chunk of problems that you that you want to address uh and and outcomes that you want to achieve and so that's really what we do. I mean, we we spend a lot of time saying, okay, what what kind of support experience or what kind of product experience do you want three years from now? Uh, and we'll take and build a, a big strategy around that. I mean, you can start with uh, a lot of different models, and there's a lot of different approaches to how to how to get there. Um, you know, one common one is the Amazon press release, which I think you and I have used before uh, to say, hey, what, you know, what would the press write about you if you were successful at the end of this road? Um, I also, you know, like spec creative and, and uh, painting a picture for, uh, for stakeholders and for team members to really understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish capabilities, the feeling, uh, you know, the intangibles of an experience, and then, um, and then back that up with the actual uh, measurable outcomes that you want out of a, uh, out of an exploration. And once you have that picture, the bigger picture, then it becomes much easier to go into, uh, you know, a session with your teams and say, hey, what do we really want to have happen by the end of next year? You know, what does success look like? What what will we be, you know, what's a can't fail for next year? And what does, you know, if we accomplish this next year, we will be happy when, and then you start to define what it is that you'll actually spend the year building. Yeah. And I think this is the way that I've really broken it out for the last, uh, yeah, the last several years. Um, this has been a path to success for us. Yeah. And so, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense, but how do you have understanding of what the user is needing um, to drive that vision or to augment um, along the way? How yeah. have you learned about your user? You know, really differently everywhere that I've worked. Um, I think there's not one method for it. So, you know, one thing that I've kind of loved about the bigger companies is that there are uh, just a different set of resources that are available in a very small, uh, in a small company. So, for example, um, uh, user research, uh, really being able to identify pain points, uh, you know, that customers are experiencing, but also, uh, you know, data scientists and analytics teams that are really eager to identify goals that will lead to um, lead to business success or patterns that will lead to customer success. And so um, that's been one really fun thing about joining, um, joining uh, a big company again, is that you have access to folks who are thinking in terms of, uh, you know, the discovery and the kind of understand work uh, for what success can look like. Um, but Product always has an opinion about this, uh, you know these uh, um, these trends, and in a lot of places, it's because you know product managers at smaller companies have to do all of that. Um, so we substitute real proper data science with back of the napkin math that you try to play out. 
and you you know substitute maybe um, the perfect uh, user experience research with quick and dirty observations and trying to find customers wherever they are and you know and that could be you know b to c or b to b and you just kind of scrappily find your way to as much data as possible to help shape what success looks like um, both are effective uh, but they require a lot of attention and trying to figure out how to make them defendable and and stand up so I would say, you know, depending on uh, on what kind of inputs go into your discovery process or your understand process, uh, you will spend a lot of time testing um, in very different ways to validate, you know, uh, your findings. And so, you know, that is probably one of the bigger changes. I mean, when you and I worked together at Adobe, we had uh, we had very aggressive testing partners that helped us measure and grow uh, with, uh, you know, and constantly challenged us to iterate on the experiences that we were building so that we, uh, we can end up with a more effective product. Um, You know, I think the testing culture experimentation culture and growth cultures are just so different place to place. Uh, And often that depends on how solid your understand or discovery work is at the, at the beginning of a project. Makes a lot of sense. And something I, I'm curious about there is uh, potentially, and I could have misheard, but like the user research, the discovery work could not only inform, but negate some of the need for testing in the future. Is that right? Yeah, um, sure. I think the... Not yeah, all testing, the- but just like kind of that idea of like trying to test an idea that I have no idea about <laughs> with a cu- with an audience. But if you have some idea about that with an, a, some pre work, it does at least decrease some of the timing that's needed for optimization. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, um, product testing and experimentation, I think, takes many different forms. So, yeah. you know, I think. Uh, you know, if you recall, uh, at Adobe, we would test often and boldly, but not expect, uh, you know, amazing returns with each test. You know, no. we would have teams that when they would, you know, hit three out of 10 that were positive winners, we would invest heavily in those and ask them to go create 10 more tests that, uh, uh, that could be big. Whereas other cultures really, you know, maybe don't test as boldly because they've got so many other ways of validating. They're not testing to yeah. validate. They're testing to, you know, to optimize and grow. Uh, and so they may have a higher success rate, but, you know, similar impact over overall uh, when you think about it. So I, hmm. I find that, um, you know, growth teams and, and testing environments can really vary wildly by how much input work is already there. Um, I think in, uh, you know, if you have a, a wealth of resources and you can kind of expect, you know, in a really data backed way, how much you can grow over a certain amount of time, your testing is almost to validate that you're on track and that you can, yeah. you know, you can, you can meet that and not to do, uh, you know, we have no idea if our customers are into <laughs> this or that, and we've got to go pursue, yeah. you know, we've got to go pursue. Yeah, we'd always joke about that, right? Flashing yellow buttons versus like something else, you know, like this one brand and all that kind of stuff. So, right. Yeah. And that's know. the other piece is that you can test to see how far into your discomfort zone you can get to um, <laughs> before you realize, like, hey, uh, product principles and, you know, what our customers expect is, uh, you know, needs to, needs to take hold. Yeah. Well, I like that idea of the idea of, Testing has multiple versions, optimi- optimizing what's there, validating you're on the right path, and probably also validating that user research. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, the you know, user research is uh, it's invaluable when you're starting and you need to figure out um, you know what's important or what customers will tell you is important to them. Um, but there's actually nothing quite like testing an experience to really figure out in reality if, you know, if it's still important when customers aren't being asked, you know, yeah. in a, I mean, it's the, the classic problem with uh, our challenge to qual is it's one input. Uh, yeah. you know, qualitative research is one input and people behave differently when they're on the clock or they've got, you know, money at stake or a project that's due and they need to use your, you know, your software uh, and it has to deliver for them in a way that is much more contextually connected to their 
job or their outcome than a survey context or a, you know, or a focus group or something like that. So I always, you know, uh, you know, definitely take all the inputs to see how to, how to point yourself. But, you know, you always have to have a critical eye and make sure that you're turning the problem over in every direction uh, as the new data points come in. Um, it's the only way to make sure that you're going to stay on track. I was just going to ask about qual versus quant and um, specifically with smaller companies. And I know that you had the have uh, the ability to do volume and which quant kind of requires in some form, or at least portions of that. What recommendations would you have for those smaller companies, those that may not have the billions, millions um, of, of visits or, you know, things to their product? What would you recommend to them uh, to kind of have that, that balance still of quality and quant? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, not just small companies, but maybe B2B companies with smaller, uh, you know, customer sets, um, where the quant really never catches up. I mean, it just doesn't, you know, it takes so long to run a test because you don't get effective samples. You, you know, you really dependent on how people feel and the kind of the perception metrics of what happens after they use your, your product. And so, um, I think it's really just important to accept and embrace that they're really different Man. kinds of validation techniques. Um, I do think that, you know, one area that comes up is you know, a lot when you're doing qual and quant is, you know, just the interplay of like what's actually needed and a nice to have, but you wouldn't trade it if you got both signals. So like, for example, um, you know, when I think back at the features we built at SoundCloud, um, you know, which is a music player essentially. And, uh, uh, we were trying to figure out ways on the group that I was running on how to, you know, help creators engage with their, with their audiences and fans, you know, and we, uh, we built a lot of things that were uh, kind of required of music players that we all know about. And you see them when you're using other music players. Um, but then we, we tried to do some things that were really, uh, original to unique to the brand and to SoundCloud. Um, and so one feature that was really, uh, really fun to release was this idea of comments on the waveform. So SoundCloud would always have a waveform of, uh, uh, that went along with the track as you, as you went through. And when you could comment at a certain point in the track, um, as a user, as a listener, you can comment and actually say, Ooh, I love this part, or I can't believe she hit that note, or I can't, you know, whatever, right. whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, it changed the level of engagement in a way that, you know, that we, we weren't expecting. Um, so that it was really like a, an opportunity for creators and fans to analyze together, which was an activity that we weren't really expecting to, um, to have be so rich, you know? And so, uh, you know, sometimes you, you, play in a space because of qual that you wouldn't normally hit um, with quant. And that was uh, an example where, you know, like really understanding how customers use uh, a certain feature can be really helpful. At the same time, probably the most popular feature we built was like, you know, dark mode. <laughs> and it's like, you know, it doesn't really do anything for the business, but it makes people happy and they okay. can feel like they can, you know, they'll use it and, you know, they solve problems in ways that, uh, uh, you know, we weren't really expecting. So, you know, if somebody's in a nightclub in Berlin in the techno spot and they want to pull out their SoundCloud and they don't want their phone to light up the room. <laughs> <laughs> so dark mode is really practical. I mean, it just, it, it makes simple. you laugh that it's something so simple actually uh, that really wasn't that hard to come up with is, uh, is literally, you know, an incredibly impactful feature to customers, but not to the business. So. Well, that's interesting. Cause like sometimes maybe the simpler or more foundational, like you just do it. It's going to be great. Some of the more complex things, like I think it's super interesting uh, about yeah. the wave. I'm a sound nerd. Um, so it's like about those waves and stuff and then be able to comment at certain intervals of, of a, a song or whatever. Like I could see where that then becomes like, it's a different type of audience. One is like, I'm listening. I want it to be in a club. The other one is like, I'm creating. And I understand what's going on mm -hmm. here. Like that's interesting. It's two different audiences. I think that you're, that you're just, using the very same product at the very same, same time. product. Yeah. 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 It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so another question I have um, that you've experienced in a lot of your positions is about the global ramifications of what you're doing. 
And um, so I'm curious about that. Your thoughts about um, product within a global framework doesn't mean we have to go into all the details about every country or anything, but like, how does, how does that change from like, let's just say a North American only approach, US only approach. Product is done one way. Um, yeah. Now, yeah, we had global, some, <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, we really had some uh, amazing, uh, I mean, that was such a huge topic at Adobe um, mm-hmm. when we made the switch from Creative Suite to Creative Cloud. Um, because, you know, the the business model was so different. Um, you know, Creative Suite, as you recall, was to put down a lot of money up front for software that you would own and use or license and use for um, for either 18 months or, you know, or three years, depending on when you chose to upgrade next. Um, and Creative Cloud brought the entry point really low, uh, but it was a monthly fee that you would pay over time. And you had a feeling that you didn't own the software, even though you licensed it the very same way. And so, you know, while in some markets, the easier access sometimes is as mundane as when customers, you know, when uh, businesses will do their invoices or can they put it on a credit card or did they have to, buy, you know, save up a budget for a big spend? Uh, you know, sometimes really the question is as simple as how you pay for it. Um, yeah. But we also noticed a, a huge variety in the way that people used the creative products in different markets. And so it was really difficult for privacy sensitive markets like Germany, where I live now, uh, to, uh, to even tolerate the, you know, the always on cloud aware, uh, context that, um, that creative cloud moved into. Um, or the idea of leasing, uh, in Japan was such a, you know, such a shock to that system, just not the way that people bought software there, uh, for Creative Suite. So, um, yeah, so there are definitely usage patterns that need to be addressed. Um, but, you know, now when we coach, uh, our teams, like I coach a team that's really London based with folks all over Europe. Um, but our team also has plenty of, uh, we have plenty of teammates in North America. And we have to play, you know, not just with uh, GDPR, which most, you know, multinational companies, do, uh, uh, you know, spend a lot of time figuring out how to navigate um, just a few years ago. Uh, but those laws advance. And now, um, you know, the Digital Services Act that's affecting all of the, the EU, um, you know, is helping us understand new ways and new standards for how to manage data, how to manage products. So yeah, the locations have just so many different uh, uh, aspects. Um, and that's not even to mention, uh, you know, how do you localize a product to truly feel like it's native to the market that it's uh, that it's being delivered in? So, you know, uh, I think Meta has um, I mean, just a shocking number of languages in which it operates because people advertising both their small and big businesses uh, around the world will uh, will be paid customers in their market. Uh, so it's um, it's truly amazing. Uh, but yeah, uh, how do you make sure that you know your com- your company is uh, your brand is giving off exactly um, what your customers need and want uh, in very different contexts? Oh uh, yeah, and I, I can't even imagine with Meta. At Adobe, we obviously had our, our things we had to deal with. And part of it was languages, translations, things like that. But then the other part was, like you kind of mentioned, how do you make it more regionalized? Like yeah. the look and the feel, the, the thing that's actually there. Um, follow-up question on this then is, uh, what do you, it's probably hard to answer, but like the balance of that, like the power in which a region or you know, it's probably region for now, but like it could be anything, I guess, a segment um, versus kind of this core product. Um, talk to me about like your thoughts on the balances of those things. Yeah, that is a good question. I mean, look, I think uh, uh, in some ways you're really just doing a, a dance to ensure that, um, you know, that a look and feel is appropriate in the local market. So, you know, what kind of... Uh, images and and models might you use in a market where um you know in two markets where people look differently and dress differently and and uh, the cultural norms are different i mean i think that's for sure something that we came up with at adobe um and i just loved uh talking with our japanese uh, uh colleagues who would say look 
Adobe sounds like a Japanese word. And so there's a lot of people in Japan who believe that Adobe is a Japanese company. Like, let's not ruin that for them. You know, let's make it, let's make it feel like, a, uh, you know, we, we don't have to explain that it's not. Um, but then I also feel like there's, there are really great products out there um, that provide the right kind of foundation, the right base where people can use them and apply them in really different ways. So, you know, for example, SoundCloud was born uh, with uh, techno scene in Berlin, uh, you know, by uh, by two founders who wanted a chance to share all the music that they were mixing. Um, and then it had, you know, different uh, waves of artists from completely different parts of the of the world that um, that used it for really different applications. So it became, you know, SoundCloud rap and the world of hip hop, you know, really interpreted it in many different ways. Uh, but, you know, for a long time, our biggest market was, you know, either Atlanta rap or suburban Paris, you know, or, um, you know, you'd be surprised what was going on in <laughs> Vietnam, like the amount of what? uploads from Vietnam. And, you know, you realize like, you know, it, the product means something to you because of the way that you've, you know, you've adopted it, but it also means something to somebody else in a way that you've never expected. Yeah. Uh, and I think good products can actually pull that off um, in fun ways. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Another big question. AI. Um, oh, yeah. We haven't talked about this yet, <laughs> but I know this has changed your role a little bit, like and how you address what you're doing, um, as it's changed just about every role uh, that it's in a development creative product space at this day and age. I'm wondering if you could talk through like how that has changed uh, or evolved, what you are up to, what your team is up to. Um, and we'll start there. How has it evolved, uh, your yeah. product teams? You know, it's funny. I mean, I think you're right to use the word evolve because it's not totally new. I mean, we've, it's you not. know, we've, it's not. I mean, when we think about, you know, content aware fill in Photoshop or, you know, these features that were kind of hard to explain. And so we gave them labels like, you know, IBM Watson created this or Adobe Sensei created this. And it's not, you know, there, uh, that concept is not, um, you know, that magic is not uh, something that is, uh, that's, that's new. I think the chat GPT kind of craze, uh, helped people, uh, adopt at a higher rate. And so, um, so then the demand, you know, the focus of the demand gets there. But, you know, like even at a company like, like Meta, I mean, AI drove lots of the metaverse, you know, development. Uh, so it was not a tough switch for, um, or, or tough, you know, kind of, uh, challenge for, uh, some focus at a company to, you know, to suddenly say, Hey, you know, it is AI that we're, you know, that we're, uh, you know, very focused on and can be a powerful, uh, a powerful kind of, um, accelerator for uh for capabilities across a wide set of applications so it's not um it's not new i do think that the uh you know there's a lot of rightful hysteria around uh like hey you know is ai in the hands of the good and can we figure out like how to do it responsibly um but you know when you recall and you look at the historical arc of things i mean people also thought that the word processor was gonna you know um was like cheating for somebody writing an essay and that uh you know um having google in your pocket or google translate in your pocket um you know is it cheating or is it actually an effective tool to communicate with uh, uh with others or to be prepared yeah so like most advances it takes some time to get used to um and i think the responsible uh companies will see ai as an accelerator uh, and a way to enhance. So I do actually really like the way Adobe talks about AI as a chance to do a lot of the mundane tasks, even though, um, let's be honest, like some of those tasks are not mundane that AI is accomplishing. Like they are, you know, uh, but I think when you, you'll get believers when you can actually see how it benefits the, um, the actual experience. How do you, find a needle in a haystack when you're searching for that perfect stock image. Um, how do you, you know, uh, uh, in the support world, the needle in the haystack is actually helping somebody who's brand new to, uh, um, to a support scenario, you know, find out what, how to help somebody, um, by searching an entire knowledge base in, you know, in rapid time. Um, or, 
to solve for scale, you know, um, using automated assistance to, uh, to be able to push more people further down the path towards a successful outcome, uh, so that you don't have to hire 30 million people to <laughs> work the farms in right. and, and right. chat windows. So I think that, um, you know, the promise is that there's going to be speed. The responsibility is, is that we come with quality and, uh, and, um, you know, real effectiveness with, uh, with what comes out of AI. One thing I heard in there was like, well, AI is artificial intelligence. It's actually trying to connect you, your product better, uh, with your user. Um, and it can do it more at scale because like you said, someone can find something faster, really have a deep dive into some things that maybe filters and search just couldn't do before. Is that yeah. sound part right? Yeah. I mean, I think the, uh, the artificial parts tricky. I think that's, yeah. I, you know, I liked it better when we referred to it as machine learning. I mean, essentially <laughs> we're talking about patterns right. that, uh, uh, you know, patterns that can evolve over time. So even though it's, um, you know, artificial in name, it's actually quite intelligent in the sense that it can evolve with, uh, you can teach a, a, a pattern to evolve. Um, I think when you, well, one of the things that we, you know, we talk about in the support world, this is certainly not just meta, but anywhere you go is like, you know, when you, when you're stuck, whatever product you're using, whatever experience you're in, when you're stuck, do you want the problem solved fast? Do you want it solved right? Or do you want it solved with a person? And ideally, like, do you have all three of those, you know, of those, all three of those. And so, you know, we think a lot about what premium support is and what, like, you know, what should you deliver to your most needed customers? And often there's a, you know, there's a correlation of, you know, uh, you know, should it be, should you always be able to talk to a person? Is that what a real concierge kind of uh, great support experience is? Or, you know, if you're busy at work and you don't want to chit chat or you come from a culture that doesn't chit chat, I live in Germany, there's not a lot of chit chat here. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, do you just want the answer fast? Uh, but if you're in Germany and you want the answer fast, but you don't want to chit chat, but you also don't trust an automated agent, you know, what does that mean for the, so like there's, there's a million dynamics to, to kind of play at at one time. Um, I think that the, uh, the companies that will be really successful with AI will have the right balance of the customer facing applications. You know, how can a, how can an end user, how can a customer actually feel uh, empowered by working with something that's automated um, and has the superpower of being able to discover, find, match, solve uh, at a high speed? Um, and the technology actually improving on the back end, um, knowledge bases, metadata and tagging, you know, working through ontology so that you always get the right connection and that, you know, it really improves triage. And then you can think, well, wow, you know, you've taken some pattern of a symptom, a problem, and you've, uh, you know, and you've applied it to uh, some knowledge base. And now suddenly you know how to diagnose, how to get somebody to the right place quickly, um, and then what action to take. And you know, I think that's a good promise for us. I mean, I think that overall, I think that's um, uh, that's a worthy pursuit. But again, it has to be done with the right outcome uh, in mind. You're talking about like the support framework. It also reminded me of projects like time, resources, quality. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what classic, I mean? Yeah. It's yeah, the classic yeah. one. I, it, it makes a lot of sense. And if AI can help with those things um, in some form, faster more resources um, yeah. and quality, better quality based upon learning. And, and um, that's interesting, but I do want to talk about that, like quality, because I'll just say as a chat GDP user, um, I found the quality to be lacking in the past. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's gotten I mean, a lot better, that, but it's yeah. learning. So how, learning. how do you think about like something like that learning, uh, which is, I'm curious about your thoughts there. Well, it's funny, we, um, uh, you know, like when ChatGPT came out and, you know, of course, like the kids want to try it out and use it. And, you know, <laughs> All the kids. 
And then suddenly you feel like every press release or job description or every like kind of, you know, this is going to take me 20 minutes to write or am I going to, am I going to uh, pound it out in two minutes with chat GPT? Um, you realize like you can start to see the slip in quality that comes from rushing. Um, but I think that's the wrong way to use uh, an application like uh, like ChatGPT or any other llama that um, is out there. If you look at, um, I mean, I remember early on watching uh, a demo of somebody write um, write some code with ChatGPT and say, "Would this ever suffice?" And you know, in the real world, um, and what we uh, what what came out of the ChatGPT, you know, it was buggy code. Um, and so everyone said, oh, this is, you know, this is a very mediocre experience until those, the same person said, okay, chat GPT, fix my code, <laughs> you know, go debug my code and um, fix it. And after four times of doing that, in just a matter of uh, maybe a minute, um, the code was in much better shape. And so, you know, I think the... That's uh, crazy. Yeah. I, I just think we, you know, if we're going to use different tools to solve problems in really different ways, we'll have to um, change the way that we approach these problems and and uh, the way that we manage uh, those yeah those those players. If they're automated agents or they're automated uh, assistants, then um, you know we'll have to work with them in different ways that that play to their strengths and and uh, get the outcomes that we want. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, but the learning part of that is also interesting. Like you were saying, yeah. like even the first version to, compared to like, you know, fix it. Like it, it, it's, it learns long, along the way, which is also crazy. Yeah. Um, but you know, like we have a friend in Berlin who wants to be a back to schooler and she was really not what, looking sorry. forward. Back to schooler. Uh, she wanted to go back to, uh, sorry, she wanted to go back to an adult person who wants to go back to <laughs> university. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> and she uh, uh, she was really nervous about it. She's like, you know, really the writing writing from scratch was her um, was mm. her issue. And so she's sitting around our you know living room and talking with our our family. And my daughter says to her, like, you don't need to worry about writing the first draft. Just get your first draft on Chat GPT. And you know, and we all kind uh. of looked at each other. And you know, my fourteen year old basically said. You never have to worry about blank page panic again because your first draft can be put together with whatever you know, uh, with whatever thoughts you had to put down into the, into the input. And the friend looked at her and said, "This is really amazing! Like it was a total un, uh, you know unlocking moment for her." And a week later, she's like, "Yep, I enrolled because I realized I like to edit. I just can't stand, you know, the idea hmm. of uh, staring at a blank page and and questioning." Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, I, look, you know, saw that example and thought, wow, like this is really, uh, I don't know if makers of chat GPT thought of, uh, of this particular application for this particular llama, but wow, like it has, uh, you know, it's changing somebody's life, you know, in, in, in ways that, you know, we hadn't thought about. So I'm, I'm optimistic because I generally am, but I, uh, you know, I also feel like, uh, it's going to be super interesting to watch. Wow, that is interesting. Um, I stare at a lot of blank pages. I should probably check, do that more often. <laughs> and now you're gonna maybe play around a little bit and see. Just change my life, Dan. Just yeah. change my life. Um, okay, so we're kind of at time here. So, Dan, before we go, question I ask everybody: advice, advice for somebody that's looking to do what you are doing now, what you've done in the past. How would they get into it? What is your advice you'd you kind of pass on to someone else? Um, good question. You know, I think the uh, I think the one the one thing that really you know it's just an intangible and hard to you know hard to um, hard to get away from is curiosity. And so, you know, if you're the, most places I've worked there's always been a flood of folks who, you know, want to do product. They want to get into product management. They, they, like you, they've had, you know, big careers in other fields and, and, you know, look at the skills that are required and take on the challenge and do it successfully. Um, there's no, there's no reason why you can't. 
Um, but if you're not curious about what it is you actually want to do it for, uh, it's really um, it's really tough. Um, some people like it because they feel like PMs are the bossiest people on a team and you can be in charge and tell people where to go. And I, that's not the, that's not a, a, always a model for success. Um, um, but, you know, we, I, I really like the model of thinking of a PM as an orchestrator uh, of all of the different pieces of a, of a team. You know, I completely reject that you have to act like a mini CEO or you have to be a field marshal or any of those kinds of uh you, the most successful PMs I know are the orchestrators. Um, and part of what makes them successful is just their curiosity. Well, can I get this person to align? Does this person share my goal? If we set this goal, do we think we can go hit it? Uh, how might we do this? How might we do that? Um, that curiosity is really, uh, I think, really the a much bigger ingredient than we have. Um, so that would be my advice is if you feel like you're curious, go use that curiosity, go, go follow it and pursue it. Uh, and then pretty soon you'll figure out that, um, yeah, that maybe you're a product manager. You need that. You need the, you need to be in the orchestrator's uh, uh, position in order to, uh, to achieve what you want to. That's great. I love it. And uh, frankly, I've seen that as being on your team at Adobe. I have appreciated flexibility that you've given me and your teams, uh, which I'm sure you're doing right now. And so, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Dan, thank you so much for joining. Uh, this has been awesome. And, Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Really good to see you. Um, yeah. yeah. Love the topics and, uh, yeah, really happy to, uh, really happy to share. All right. Well, thanks Dan. Hi, thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd appreciate it if you could leave a review of the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to help spread the word. Our podcast is produced and designed by Jeremy and Joshua Wold. You can find our show archive and transcripts at productsforpeoplepodcast.com. We look forward to seeing you for our next episode. And in the meantime, we hope you experience some really great products. Thanks. Thanks.